If you'd like to follow along with me this morning, the scripture reading is from the book of Matthew. Chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. It's Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. It's Matthew chapter 28, 18 to 20. Amen. Let all the people say, Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Wow, this is beautiful. Oh, I got it. All right. You have to understand, with a country preacher, not used to all this high-tech junk, but this is not a high-tech congregation. This is awesome. Man, you are beautiful. I'd take your picture, but Daryl says I'd go to jail if I put it on Facebook. So, all right. They'll just have this image like this. This is the seventh session that I've been honored to be with you all. Talking about growing, maturity, and how to be like Jesus. So if we did all these things that I've taught in the last six lessons and we got down to this point, then what do we do with it? It's Sunday morning, we had communion, we praised the Lord. Now, what is going to change this week? What's going to happen this week that might be different? And you woke up this morning and the news on the news channel was good or bad? Bad. You know, the White House, the country I live in, the White House looked like this. I tried to find some good news here in Edmonton, so I started picking up newspapers at the hotel every day and so I've got four days worth of news here in Edmonton and guess how much good news I found zilch yeah so what's our attitude this morning when we got up it's the Lord's Day it's the first day of the week and it's what it's all bad news I mean I've been there before Jean and I were on the banks of the Mekong Thailand was on this side, Laos was on that side, and it was 1969. How many years ago was that? That tells you how old I am. <laughs> 1993, we were there again. 1998 is when the government arrested all of us and threw us all in jail. Was that good news or bad news? I mean, what's our stinking attitude as we think about what's going on with our life? Is it good or bad? Or is it doom and gloom this morning? Where are your smiles? <laughs> wow, maybe it is doom and gloom out there. 1998, January 30th, everybody in that picture went to jail except the pregnant mamas. Who's winning? Is the devil winning or is the Lord winning? 48 folks, five foreigners, everybody goes to jail except the not head right here. He was a spy. He got off, but the rest of us did what? Well, Larry, he left at noon that day and flew back to Bangkok. He got out. In the book of Exodus, they're fleeing Pharaoh. They're coming up to the banks of the ocean of the sea. And what do the folks say after Pharaoh is coming up with his army? Exodus chapter 14, here's the complaint of the Jews. Was it because there's no graves back in Egypt that you brought us here in the desert to die? It would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than to what? To die in the desert. Is that us this morning? Listen to God's answer from Moses. Don't be afraid. Stand firm. See the deliverance of who? Of the Lord. He'll bring you today. The Lord will fight for you and you need only to be still. I left out one verse. He said you'll never see these Egyptians again. Who's winning today? The news tells you the devil is. Let's this morning change our perspective of the church. What do we think the Church of Christ is all about? 
Back in the old days, the early missionaries that went to Africa, they packed their belongings in coffins. Now, why did they do that? This seems kind of silly, doesn't it? <laughs> they knew it was a one-way trip. They aren't coming back. They were also deadly serious. They were in it for a lifetime. And this endeavor was what? One that probably uh, they won't see their loved ones again. Listen to our speech here in the Churches of Christ. I was a new Christian. Been a Christian about three years. The company offered me a position. Ken, we've got a position open in Utah. And so, wow, that's great a promotion. I love that. And so, telling the brethren at the church in El Centro, hey, the company's going to move me to, to Utah. They said, oh, Ken, you can't go. Well, why not? Well, there's no church there. Oh, so our concept of the church is if we have one of these, we can go. But if we don't have one of these, guess what? We, we can't go there. And so we believe the church is strong in the Bible Belt down in Arkansas and Texas and Edmonton, but it's not strong in Sigurd, Utah, so we can't go there. You know, you elders, if we had them, well, you've got to defend the church from all this nonsense, and you can't move there, because and this is Richfield, Utah. Gene and I lived there for a year and a half. We didn't die. Well, what's our concept of the church? Let's read this verse from Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Jesus said, I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Wow. Think about that. Matthew 16, 18. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. So what are these things here? That's a gate of a city, a walled city, okay? And the power of that city is measured by its gates, because that's where the enemy attacks. And so the gates mean what? The gates mean power. How powerful are you? So if that's the gates, then who's on the defense? Jesus said the gates of Hades will not overcome it. But gates are a defensive thing. They're not an offensive thing. Who grabs a gate and goes to war? Well, nobody does. They put a gate out there what? to stop the enemy from coming in. Wow. So then the gates of Hades refers to the court, the power, the throat of the kingdom of hell. So the gates of Hades then are what? Are being broken down from the outside by those who are outside trying to get inside to the, the what? The kingdom of Satan. And Satan, his demons are where? They're cowering outside, the, inside their fortress. And God's got what in the church of Christ? He's got a smart bomb. And what do you do with a smart bomb? It goes exactly where you want it to go, which is what? The gates of Hades. And so what Jesus is saying is the church of Christ is what? We're not on the defensive. We're on the offensive. Wow, can you believe that? Us here in the Church of Christ have got to take our coats off. Folks, we're, we're on the offensive. Matthew 16, 18 says what? <laughs> no, don't back up. Do what? Forget your dumb microphone. That's what you do. <laughs> Daryl, I apologize. Wow. Can you believe it? Mic tie. Matthew 16, 18 says one thing for all of us that's here this morning. We need to take those words of Jesus and we need to understand what the Lord is saying. Folks, we are not in the Boy Scouts. Folks, we're not the Ladies' Aid Society. Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 says, The gates of Hades shall not prevail against the Church of Christ. You and I are in the Calvary. You and I are not hunkering behind the doors. We're not in the defense. We're in the what? We're in, can you all say that? We're in the what? Offense. We're in the offense. If they're in the offense, what's that mean? That means we're in the Calvary. What is that verse we just read a few minutes ago? Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Go ye into where? All the world. 
Before he said that, he said, All authority in heaven and earth have been given to me in heaven and on earth. Then go. So we're not in the army. We're in the Green Beret. Except y'all don't have Green Berets up here, do you? We got Mounties. <laughs> so we're, who are we all? We're the Lord's Mounties. That's what we are. And we're not in defensive position. We're in the offensive position. I can hear that theme song from the Lone Ranger. Dun, 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 dun. Can you remember that? Yeah. Did you ever see the movie The Chariots of Fire? Wow. Does that just get your heart pumping? I mean, your blood just running? And that's who we all are this morning. We're what? We're the offensive folks. Simple preachers have simple lessons. Think you can remember three points? Number one, let's get dead. Number two, let's get excited. And number three, let's get out of the fortress. Let's talk about that in the last eight minutes we have. If we're going to be in the Calvary, we're going to have to die to self. We're just going to have to get ourselves out of the picture. Think about what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but who? Christ liveth in me. How does that work out? We take that verse so easy. I can read it and it just, it just goes in one ear and out the other. What's it mean to be crucified with Christ? What Paul's saying is, hey, we're dead. Once we are baptized in the Christ, we did what? We rose to a new life. But we died to ourself. And what's that mean? That means that, you know, from now on, what is it? We look at Jesus, and when he died, oh, wow. Matthew 27, verse 36 is probably the cruelest verse in the whole Bible. They had just crucified Jesus. And here's the soldiers, and this is what the verse says about those soldiers. There they sat and they watched him. What's going on? You've seen that movie, The Passion of the Christ? Wow. You talk about cruel. You talk about agony. The death on the cross is the worst thing you can ever imagine. And then on top of that, they do what? They malign him. They call him all these names. Who's doing that? God's son. Who's he doing that for? Us. And then we're supposed to do what? Die to ourselves. Unfortunately, we're not sure how we relate to that. Some years ago in Bible class, Sue Hollis, our preacher's wife, was teaching the kids about the rest of the crucifixion. And so she went through the story of what happened, the, the, the guards and, the, and the, where the disciples were, and how they crucified Jesus. And she said, okay, now kids, we're going to role play. One of you be the Jesus, one of you be the... Some of you be the guards and some of you be the disciples. And one little five-year-old girl said, Miss Hollis, yes, hon, I don't want to play Jesus. And that's kind of our answer. We don't want to play Jesus because we know exactly what happened to the Lord. We know exactly what that, that counted. Jesus came to die for his cause. John 12 says, My heart's troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No! It was for this very reason that I came. Jesus knew that. Verse 24, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls and what dies, it remains only of seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So our choice this morning is we're in the Calvary. Do we want to play Jesus or be Jesus? This is the seventh lesson I've taught trying to get over what I think the Jesus taught, what the New Testament taught about what? All of us becoming like the Lord. Thinking, acting, 18 different ways to be that. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he's got to deny himself. Ooh, take up our cross and follow me. Luke 20, 14, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own... Oh my goodness. Mother, father, wife, children, brothers, sisters. Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. No one of you can be my disciple who does not give up his own possessions. Mom still hates me for becoming a member of the Church of Christ. You know, she raised me in the Presbyterian Church, and that's what Presbyterians do. They stay Presbyterians all their life. But this dumb guy married a lady from the Church of Christ, and guess what happened? We studied our Bibles. And all of a sudden, Mom, you can't be an elder in the church because it's got to be the husband of one wife. What's the gun trick here? And so Mom's still mad at me, and she passed away 20 years ago. <laughs> 
What's it mean to follow Luke chapter 14? Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19, and Paul says, Until Christ be formed in you. You find Epaphroditus in Philippians chapter 2. It says, For the work of Christ, he was haphazarding, or hazarding his life. And the New American Standard said he was risking his life for the work of God. That's a gambling turn. That means he was taking his life and, and playing and gambling with it like these folks do in, in the casino. Until Christ be formed with us, Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus understood what that means. He was actually taking his life and gambling with it for what? For this Calvary. So if we want to charge, we're going to have to die. We have to get rid of everything that stands between me and the cross. So that's your SUV. Oh, you don't have one. Well, that's good. We don't have to deal with that one, will we? How about your iPhone? Does that get between... Whoops. Now I've gone to Midland, haven't I? What is it that gets between us and Jesus? What is it that's more important, like our kids' college education, or the mortgage on that house, or the payments on that car? I tell you how to get rid of those car payments, buy old cars. I mean, there's just answers to all these things that get between us and the Lord. And so, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ, and what? I no longer wear designer jeans. Is that kind of tacky? I hope not, because I think that's what he's talking about. Point number two. Point number one was what? That's not very good English, is it? But it's very brutal. You understand it? Let's try that again. What was point number one? No, Y'all awake out there? Hey. <laughs> Somebody remember point number one. Thank you. All right. Point number two. Let's get excited. You look in your concordance and find the word enthusiasm. It's not in there. But the synonyms are, which is fervency, fire, eagerness, willingness, okay? And the opposite would be boring, you know. That's what the folks think about worship. It's boring, okay? But the Greek word means inspiration. To be possessed by a God. To have a frenzy, to have a religious frenzy. How long has it been since we had a religious frenzy here in the South Edmonton Church of Christ? I mean, where we really all got excited and we were all zealous and we are just jumping up and down. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he's coming to you very earnestly with much enthusiasm in the quotes and on his own initiative, trying to find this, this word enthusiasm, the excitement that we feel coming to worship and being involved in the, in the church here. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I know your eagerness to help, been boasting about to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year you and Acacia were ready to give, and your zeal, that enthusiasm, has stirred most of them to action. Enthusiasm is what? Infectious. It's like the flu. Last October, some kid gave me the bug, and I've still got it. I mean, that's what enthusiasm does. It just stays with you. And that's what we want here in the Edmonton, South Edmonton. We don't want to talk about the North. We want to talk the South Edmonton, Church of Christ. It's what? We all want to have the flu, the flu of enthusiasm. If anyone in Canada is excited, it ought to be us this morning. Winston Churchill had it right. He said, success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no what? Loss of enthusiasm. Time Magazine said in back in 89, the reason the churches lose their members, they what? They fail to transmit the meaning and excitement of Christianity from one generation to another, one person to another. If your kids are excited about church this morning, it's because mom and dad, you're excited. Huh. And if you folks are excited about the Church of Christ this morning, it's because Roy is excited. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Roy can jump up and down. Yeah, he can show his enthusiasm. I mean, you don't have to act like I do to be enthusiastic. You can be like Bill and Helen back there. Bill's 84. I met him in 2004, wasn't it? 1994. How many years ago was that? Wow, back in Mesa, Arizona. Wow. So I've known you all since 1994, and you didn't even know that. You know, it's great to be with folks that we find the Church of Christ is so small because anywhere in the world we find folks that we love and appreciate. So can we transmit this excitement, this enthusiasm from Grandpa the father and son, the sons, and now I'm trying to infect my great-grandkids and they're only a year and a half old. Think about the potential for that. Can we put passion in our faith? Can we get excited about our faith? 
First, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul tells Timothy, stir up the gift that's within you. That Greek means to stir in the flame. I know we get bored sometimes with what we're doing. Sometimes preachers are boring. You're always never boring, are you, Roy? Oh, no. No. Good. Okay. In my Thai Bible, I didn't bring it because we were trying to pack lightly. But on the front page of the Thai Bible that I used for 20 years in Thailand, I have this news article. And the headline was, Beaten to Death. And this 34-year-old believer in China had been arrested by the police, taken to jail, and they figured they'd keep her 15 days and released her, but she died that day. Turns out the police actually beat her to death because she refused to give up what she was doing, which was handing out Bibles in China. That takes kind of the zoom out of life, doesn't it? Think of, and our prayer this morning was, thank you, Lord, that we don't have the fear of persecution here this morning. Uh, in China, in 2007, in this province, that was a little bit tough. Thailand, we didn't have that persecution. Here in Edmonton, we don't have that persecution. We have other kinds. We have bad, bad mouths, and we have sticks and stones that break my bones, but names will never hurt me stuff. But this is worse than, than that. Put passion in our faith. Number three, point number one was yeah. get dead. The point number two? Get excited. Get excited. Okay, you can't get excited. All right, we got to get excited. <laughs> and then thirdly, let's get out of the dumb fortress. What are you talking about, Ken? Well, sometimes our concept of the church is this. You know, we've got these strong walls and we're keeping the devil out. We got this great preacher and he preaches the truth and we're keeping that false doctrine out. That's not Matthew 16, 18. Matthew 16, 18 is the devil's inside and we're outside trying to what? Break the doors down. We're the cavalry. We're the offensive troops. We're the green beret. We're the mounties. And you know what? Back in America, in my country, we're circling the wagons. Why did the pioneers circle the wagons? Well, that was defensive. That was to keep the, the Indians out, trying to, to protect the, the families, okay? And that's what we do back in America. The fastest growing group in the Churches of Christ in, Thailand, in, in America is youth and family ministers. Why is that? Why are we training youth ministers and family ministers when we ought to be trained ev evangelists? Anybody know Klein Payton or Parker Henderson or Gordon Hogan? They were my heroes when I was young. Parker Henderson is the guy that recruited me to go to Thailand for 10 years, and it lasted about 20. Klein Payton was the guy that, that was director of the Sunset School of Preaching. Gordon Hogan was down in Singapore. Anybody know Kevin Carson? Yeah. Nah. Everybody that's been to Cambodia, please raise your hand. Oh my goodness. Wow. Thank you. If I did that in Mesa, our home congregation that has 450 members, and our time wasn't in Cambodia, it was in Thailand. And if I said, everybody has been to Thailand, please raise your hand, you know how many I'd get? One. <laughs> My wife. <laughs> Just think of the influence of Kevin and Catherine and all of you about the nation of Cambodia. We prayed about that. We talked about that this morning. Wow, that many folks would go from here, fly 10,000 miles and go, them rice eaters, folks that eat that kind of yicky food, speak that yicky language. You all do actually do that? Yeah. Why? Because we're what? We're part of this group that's not circling the wagons. How come we have in the States now, we have instrumental music services on Saturday night. How come we have the Lord's Supper on Saturday night now? Why is it that we seem to just be focusing on us inside and forget about the seven billion folks that are headed to the bad place? Someone told me that Canada has about 36 million people. Is that true? Yeah. How many are part of the Churches of Christ? If the odds are like they're in Thailand, Thailand is 96% Buddhist. America has, I don't know how many members of the church. And so if you look at the odds and statistics, you say, hey, we're losing. You need to look at it like Jesus does. 
He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go ye, that's us. So we're in the what? We're not in the home guard. We're in the mounties. We're in the cavalry. We've got to get out of this business of going on campaigns and mission trips. We have family retreats, singles camps, youth seminars. Our folks in Mesa do this thing called Feed the Starving Children. Once a month they go down and pack food for folks that are going to Feed the Starving And they, boy, we, we've really worked for the Lord. We gave three hours out of a month. Go ye into where? All the world to do what? Preach the gospel to who? Every tribe, every creature, every person. How are we going to get that done? You know, it's not that the word missionary is not in the Bible. Did you ever check your concordance? Look under the M's. M-I-S-S-I-O-N-A-R-Y. It ain't there. Where do we get this word missionary? I'm glad you ask. It's not in the Bible. It comes from the Latin word for martyr. What's a martyr? Someone that does what? Dies in sharing their faith. A resume for Paul would be in 2 Corinthians 11. How many times was he shipwrecked? How many times was he stoned? How many times did he have all these horrendous things happen to him? And so we support native preachers in El Salvador and Ghana and Guyana. And we call them missionaries. But missionary is someone that leaves their culture, leaves their language, leaves their family and does what? Go to the far country. Leave their family. Pick up a new language. Pick up a new food diet. You all like rice? How do you like uh, dog food? How do you like eating dog? You like catfish heads? Well, you're never going to make it as a missionary unless, you know, we adapt our diet to, to what? A different, a different diet because that's what missionaries do. They go to these strange places, speak these lang languages in another culture, in another language. We were overseas for 20-some years. Never met a native preacher in Laos, or Thailand, or Burma, or Cambodia that wouldn't like to come and work with you all. Why is that? Why is it all the folks that are gospel preachers all over the country, they would be delighted to come to Edmonton, and they would be your missionaries to your neighbors. Why? Well, because, guess what? Your schools are so much better than their schools. And there's nobody that wouldn't love to have their children go to school here in Edmonton. Or in my home of Mesa. Why is that? Well, it seems we think that Canada and America are kind of heaven on earth. And we'd love to educate our children in the finest education facilities in the world. Our school system right here. What happens when we leave the fortress? What happens when we're part of the Lord's army, when we're part of the cavalry, we're part of this offensive group? Well, I see these folks here in this picture, all right? Seven men in that group went to prison for 18 months. Number seven lost his faith. You can barely see his head. But one, three, four, five, eight, and nine are now self-supporting preachers, graduates of preacher training in Thailand, and their sons and daughters are now in Thailand studying the Bible. They spend 494 days in prison in Laos, packed like sardines when they slept at night. And they came out of there with what? Your enthusiasm. They died already. They got excited. That's why they're in jail. And they did what? They got out of the dumb fortress. They got out of the church buildings and did what? They went into all the world to share the gospel with all the world. So what happens when we go outside the church building? Well, number six was the father of John Sow. John Sow, when we lived there, was a young college gal studying pharmacy. The government sent John Sow up to Samnua. Samnua was the head of the communist country back then, the Vietnam War. Samnua was where the, the communist government was headquartered in caves. We bombed the hound out of them so they couldn't stay out in the open, so they lived under in caves. That's where the government, government was. Sam Nua was the headquarters. And when John Sow finished pharmacy school, that's where the communist government sent her, was up to Sam Nua. We got a report back from John Sow. She said, I've got a new name. 
Oh, John Sal, what's your nickname? Ba, Satana. Ba means crazy. Satana is the word for religion. John Sal's nickname among all these communist workers is what? This religious fanatic. What was she doing? <laughs> she was in the Calvary. She was telling people about who? This Jesus, who those Laotian people up in Samnu had never heard of. They'd been under this communist umbrella for years. But now they had, the Lord had one Calvary person up in Samnu. And she was what? She was one that was a religious fanatic. Ba, Satana. So this morning we're all one of these. We're either a thermostat telling other folks what temperature is, or we're actually a what? A thermostat that changes things. So this is a thermometer, and that's a thermostat. Which one would you rather be? Would you rather control it, or would you rather indicate what's going on? Conclusion. We're out of time. We're 15 minutes over. Am I going to get fired? Keep on my button. Oh, that's yeah, good. All right, so let's stop circling the wagons. Let's get dead. Let's play Jesus. According to the power that works in us, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 says what? Above all that we can ask or think, if we're in the Calvary, guess what? God can use all of us. Let's stop blowing your tree. Let's get excited. Let's have a little religious craziness. Paul said, I can do what? All things through Christ that strengthens me. That's your verse. That's my verse. And then let's stop counting the bodies. Let's get out of the fort. Let's get thrown in jail. My God shall supply every need of yours. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. If that's our verse, if Philippians 4 13 is our verse, is there anything we can't do this week? Wow, just think about Jesus, all of us here this morning, going out and infecting Edmonton with the flu this week. How many people would we infect if we had the flu buck? Yeah. So what if we had the Jesus bug and did what? Infected folks like we could infect the flu. Wow, we could get dead, we could get excited, and then we could what? We could get out of the fortress. Remember the Titanic back in 1912? 2,200 folks on, not enough light bulbs. The second officer said, what I remember that night when the Titanic went down, I remember as long as I live. People crying out to each other as the stern begins to plunge down. I heard people crying, I love you. Even harder survivor, the sound of people drown into something I cannot describe to you. Neither can anybody else. It's the most dreadful sound there is in the dreadful sorrow, silence that follows it. Maria said they were in the water and we couldn't help them. You weren't there, but you can feel the anguish of folks that were there and survived. But well, we're here now, we're not on the Titanic. And we've got all of God's blessings and we're God's people and we're in God's army. And in 1969, Gene and I went to Thailand, but this isn't 1969, this is 2016. So back in 69, and this is how you got the Laos. You got on the Thai side of the border, you got on a ferry, and you went to the other side, and it took hours. Well, guess what? This is 2016. There's now a bridge from Thailand to Laos. So if you want to get to Laos from Thailand, it takes you five minutes. It used to take us all day. Is that a help to what we're all about here? 1969, Gene and I went to Thailand for the first time. We went by ship. It took 21 days. May 22nd, next month, we're going to get out of Boeing 747 and we'll get there in 21 hours. Wow, how much more efficient are we in our lifetime now than we were back then, 40-some years ago. Back then it took three weeks to get mail. Now we get what? I can Skype with my grandkids from Cambodia on the ship of life. Kevin does that with his family here. Wow. Back then it's what? Six weeks turnaround. Back then we had a reserve to get a phone call from Bangkok to the States. When my grandmother died, I got a telegram. Anybody know what a telegram is? Yeah, that's what I thought. You all are too young. <laughs> but that's what it was back then. Now you get instant responses, okay? 
For three years, every time we went overseas, we never saw grandparents. We'd come back for three months and then go back for three more years. Now, come home for Christmas every year. Jean's mom died. My grandmother died. My father died. Jean's sister died. Where were we all those times? 10,000 miles away. Now you can jump on the plane and be back in 20 more hours. Wow, think about that. So what can God do? 1998, January 30th, God looked down as the communist government arrested the whole church in Vinjan. All 48 of us. Now in 19... Or 2016, here's that same church. What's God done? These kids are our young people. I taught them last year in the Bible school in Kongan, Thailand. A couple of them have graduated now. What's God doing? He's blessing folks that are in the Calvary. Folks that died to themselves, folks that got excited, excited and then folks that got out of the, 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 the fortress. What does God do? He magnifies what we're doing. And somehow we just lost the... What did I do that? Let me push some more buttons. There we go. How about that? Now we're about 15 slides behind. Here's a fast review of what we just did, okay? You thought I was dumb, didn't you? Hang on. We're almost to the last one. We're back. All right. So here's a review of, of my experience of what God does with the, with the Calvary, with the Green Braves, with the Mounties, okay? In 1997, there was 40 Christians in Laos, and there was two American families there, Jerry and Meg Canville, and Jean and I. And that year, we baptized 37 folks in a communist country that forbids you to bring in Bibles, forbids you to bring in songbooks, forbids, forbids you to bring in Bible school material, you cannot meet legally. You cannot set up an assembly. You can't do anything because the government, what? Hates Christianity. And so January when we arrested three of those folks were visitors and they got to spend two weeks in jail for the, per for the privilege of answering an invitation from the, from the Vinjan Church of Christ. So the challenge this morning is when you hear that bugle charge, is it charge or is it retreat? Some of us are retreating. We get overwhelmed with church problems. We look at preachers that are bald-headed. <laughs> we look at preachers that are old. They dress stupid. They do dumb things trying to get our attention and keep our attention. And we say, wow. I told you about that lady that came into the assembly in Lampang. She went through our worship, our singing, the Lord's Supper, the preaching. And after the last prayer, she said, is this all there is? Where's the brass band? Where's the smoke bombs and the fog machines and the jumping up and down and the dancing on the pews? Welcome to the Church of Christ. Thus saith the Lord. Upon this rock, I'll do what? I'll build my church. And what? The gates of Hades will not prevail against the army, against the Green Bray, against the Mounties. Three ideas this morning. Number one, get dead, get dead die to ourselves. Number two, get excited. get excited. You can't do that if you don't smile. Number three, get out of the fortress. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the lesson. And we hope you were blessed and challenged by the word of God. The South Edmonton Church of Christ meets at the South Wood Community Center in Millwoods, Edmonton, Canada. Our location is 1880 37th Street, Northwest. Our phone contacts are in Canada, you can call us at 780-902-1329.
For those living outside of Canada, you can call us at 321-220-7519. Our meeting times on Sundays are as follows. 10 a.m. Bible class for all ages. 11 a.m. We meet for worship, to break bread, to have the communion, to remember the death of Christ. We sing, we pray, we give of our earnings as God has prospered us, and we fellowship one with another. Always remember, at the Churches of Christ, a warm welcome awaits you.